East Coast time about 4 o'clock. I know a lot of you have been all over the country. And so many of you are kind of pushing in from the West Coast or the East Coast or the Up Coast or the Down Coast. Welcome back uh, to this wonderful afternoon. Um, it's when I was up uh, at the uh, British Columbian Land Summit meeting, uh, which was held up in Whistler, very tough venue. Uh, it wasn't winter, so it was tough. Um, but um, uh, I was I was struck by how brilliant and uh, direct he was about a very very complex issue, which is water um, in the landscape. Um, so a little bit about his background. First of all, you'd be very happy to know that he was 100% trained in Scotland, uh, one of the first Germans to actually get all their training in Scotland. First as a horticulturalist. Um, and landscape technologist uh, and in New York, uh, and then later um, at Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, Daniel's background then um, is actually horticulture uh, and uh, has uh, evolved over the time um, to pick up the background in landscape architecture on top of it. Um, Daniel is registered as a landscape architect in both uh, Germany and uh, British Columbia. Uh, and he is also still a practicing horticulturalist and educator. He teaches in the postgraduate landscape architecture program at the uh, University of British Columbia. And in 2007, he founded uh, a research group called Green Skins Lab. You can find him on the web uh, under the umbrella of uh, Salas Design Center for Sustainability. Um, his new research area uh, uh, focuses on a green roof rating system, green roof agriculture, integrated rainwater harvesting, and systems for stormwater management. Um, currently, Daniel and his team are involved in the conception of a pilot project for professional urban farming in the city of North Vancouver. Uh, he tells me that uh, landscape architecture has increased in its uh, impact and its uh, presence in the world uh, due to events like Katrina or the floods in Pakistan, and landscape architects are being brought uh, front and center into places which uh, prior, uh, in, in prior circumstances might have been reserved uh, just for engineering. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, if you start reading where Daniel's practice, it includes uh, Great Britain, Japan, the United States, Germany, Italy, Austria, and China. And not only practicing there, but opening firms there, um, co-finding firms, working with, uh, uh, for instance, he uh, was the landscape um, project manager landscape, uh, in landscape design for Potsdamer Plots, which was a development in Berlin. Um, in this capacity, he's had the uh, fortune to collaborate uh, with Renzo Piano uh, and others and through uh, his participation um, in this very innovative uh, urban development, he's developed this expertise in design and construction of uh, green roofs. Um, I, I thought uh, at, uh, at lunch today, he made a very interesting um, comment about the uh, graphics in his presentation uh, in the morning lecture, and that was that it, it, uh, it took him years to develop those graphics and use uh, Daniel Thank you. Specifically for the students, obviously also for the faculty, but 
what kind of research we do and how I developed the being a practicing architect for many years before I did full time teaching and some conclusions too. When we talk about green skins, one has to really go back a little bit. And I brought some diagrams to explain. And I started up my research really in Vancouver after having practiced about 18 years as a landscape architect in many places of this beautiful world. And I came to Vancouver, and there was this sort of discussion always about urbanization, densification. And maybe a lot of you know urban. Vancouver is very famous for its sort of planning. And um, the issues we have in Vancouver is because it's so popular place to live, there's a prediction that the population will increase dramatically. And I put these two graphs here, gives you an understanding of what we are predicting by 2036. So we have about 2 million, 2.2 million with great Vancouver area. Now we're going to get another million of people. So where do we put them? How do we deal with that? What does it do to a city when we densify a city architecturally? And what are the implications, the impacts on the living in the city? That was something I was interested in. This diagram just also shows you a little bit of the urban sprawl. It doesn't go very far in Vancouver because on one hand we have the Pacific, on the other hand we have the Rockies on the other side. But we do have some areas where the sprawl can still happen and that's our best agricultural land. So there's a huge discussion now if that is the right way. And you can see in these two diagrams here from 1991 and 2006 how the straw, even over such a short period, has um, what impact it has on the city. The impact it also has is obviously on the deforestation, the biggest impact, and also that has a huge impact on the environment and the hydrological water cycle I'm going to talk about. There is this uh, interesting project, the Manhattan Project, maybe you've heard of it, and um, this sort of densification, the impact from vegetation, this, in this case, this sort of mock-up here from Manhattan, um, what it looked like in the 1600s and what it looks like today, and what it actually does to the city, just to bring it back. What it does are these kinds of detrimental effects if cities aren't planned properly. And we have seen specifically this year, I showed some slides this morning, from the floods in Pakistan, what can happen, or in Turkey last year, or in Germany even this year, or in China continuously, what can happen if the increase of the imperviousness of the surfaces in cities is not um, combated with stormwater mitigation <coughs> tools. And we, are, we as architects, planners, and uh, um, landscape architects have this opportunity, this to really tackle this field because of all of our around knowledge we sort of should have. And I always try to teach my students that they, apart from being good designers, they need to understand the science. And if they don't understand the science, that's not a problem. But at least they need to know who they're going to go to to get that knowledge to actually make the projects more thorough today. It's not good enough to be just an architect or landscape architect do beautiful landscapes which don't function in an appropriate way with the situation we have today. If you look on this diagram on the left here, this is a healthy water hydrological cycle. And this is what we really try to achieve by introducing these green skin tools, like I call them, um, on the architecture, on the landscape in cities to, to create this kind of cycle. Because the biggest problem in cities is we have to improve their buffer transpiration rates, and plants and soil can actually do that. If you look at this image here, that's the urban heat island effect. And as you can see in the two slides on the right, the top one gives you the temperature of Manhattan downtown. This is Manhattan here, there. And it gives you below the vegetation. And then when you look at these two diagrams together, you can see Central Park, for example, here, the temperature is much lower than in the surrounding areas where the buildings are standing. One of the major implications of plants that they can actually reduce the microclimate. <coughs> now, when we introduce these systems, and this is really important to state, and I tried to do that this morning, we need to look at these systems holistically. 
it is not good to just do a green facade. It's not good to just do a green street. It's not good just to do a green room. At least two of these systems need to be combined to be sustainable and viable. And in my lab, we've been trying to measure this so that we can actually argue this case. So it's not just a theory, we run data, and I will show you some of the pros projects we've been working on to give you an understanding of this. You can see here the list, I'm not going to read it because you can read it yourselves, what green rooms and what vegetation actually does. But the most important of this diagram is to show you have to at least pair of two to actually be sustainable. I'm going to dive into the first section, green roofs themselves. If you look at green roofs, there are two types of green roofs, the extensive and the intensive green roofs. These names are from Germany, extensive and intensive, but they've been translated into English. It's the same word. Basically, what it means in these two diagrams, I think, show that quite clearly. The this, this soil layers that increases with the intensity of the green roof, the weight increases, and an increased the intensive green roof has mostly, or most of the time, irrigation, while the extensive green roof doesn't have that. The other thing is the maintenance of an intensive green roof is much higher. You can plant anything from a shrub to a tree, while an extensive green roof is normally small plants like sedums, which can keep the water for quite a long time before they actually start to dry up. So the extensive green roof is actually a very good tool, very inexpensive tool to protect the green roof and also do stormwater mitigation. This morning I said that for me as a landscape architect, being in green roofs now for 20 years, I'm very critical about them. But one thing they really can do is they can mitigate stormwater. And that's actually the key and selling point for the policy makers and for us as landscape architects researching in this field to convince the policymakers that green roofs is the way forward. But you can only do that with the argument that they will save money, reducing the cost of the sewage system upgrade, for example, or uh, if actually implementing a new sewage system may not be needed because the runoff is reduced. And the most other key aspect of green roofs is uh, the reduction, and this is often a myth, people think it's cleaning the pollution and so on. It does a little bit, but what it really does, it reduces the velocity of the runoff. And when we reduce the velocity of the runoff in a hundred storm, in a hundred year event, or in the fifty year storm event, what that will happen is then the runoff into the streams and the sea will be slower, and by that the ecological impact isn't as strong as if it is now when you have these kinds of storm events because all the fish eggs, all the most important parts of the rivers is uh, basically flushed down into the sea. And that's obviously not the idea. If you look at the benefits of the green roof, there's many, and I've listed them some here, but the most important, I think, is that when you look at it, obviously it, um, it sequestrates CO2 and it produces O2 clear, evapotranspiration, microclimate effect. But one of the things for the architects to know is the roofs last, particularly when it's flat roofs, they last about double the period because of the ultraviolet light being taken away, so it's protected against the ultraviolet light, and that will obviously make these roofs much longer lasting. One thing you should know is when you introduce extensive green roofs, they do need maintenance. Maybe at least once or twice a year, somebody needs to go up there and check that there is no plants with strong roots on those roofs which could destroy the waterproofing layer. For that reason, you always need, and I've said it this morning, people have uh, in technical reports said that it's not always needed. A uh, root, root barrier is always needed on any green roof because you can't always go up there and check if a certain birch species has just arrived and drilled a hole into your system. So it's always needed a root barrier to make sure that the liability insurance is going to pay uh, uh, under these circumstances, definitely going to pay, hopefully. And another aspect, and for me the most important, of my, most of my recent research is in this field is the stormwater management. And you can see here already on these two diagrams, as higher the soil, not too high though, then you need irrigation again, as less runoff you have. And um, 
he also describes the difference between extensive and intensive, as stated on the left. Now, I will just briefly talk about the Potsdam Platz, and I have to clarify something, because often people have asked me yesterday, so, um, did you work with Dreisaitl? And I said, yes, sure, I worked with Dreisaitl. Dreisaitl, and he's a very famous man now. He's, um, he was a sculptor, he's a landscape architect now, but by training, he's a sculptor. He was in charge of the water features on the Potsdam Platz, and I will show you which part. Renzo Piano called him in to design the water. Our office was in charge of the landscape. We are landscape architects with the speciality of green design. My former bosses were in that for many, many years before I came to the firm, before I had my own firm. And then I was put in charge of this pro project from A to Z. Ten years of my life I spent on this project and doing the site supervision from the first sketch right to the last calculation. And the interesting thing working with Herbert Dreisleitel was he requested water from me which had a low nutrient content so that there wasn't so much algae growth in his pond because we were not allowed to use city tap water for filling the pond. We only were allowed to use rainwater. It's a policy issue. So he required for me that water. So I had to run tests. This is now in 1994, 95. And that got me interested in research and being in this field now since then. And I'm just going to show you some images of this project. So when I talk about this project, I talk about this part. This is the Daimler Chrysler, now Daimler Lane Park. This is Renzo Piano's um, theater in here. And then some of his buildings are by Renzo Piano. Then there's Moneo, and there's Arato Susaki, there's Richard Rogers. And there's Laura and Burr, a German office. And this here is the pond have a dry cycle design. Underneath the plaza, he designed the cleansing system, which is a very complex system, and all the water features along it. Anything else, all the green rooms, all the courtyards inside, I had the pleasure to do for 10 years. And the interesting thing was what we did, and that was the concept by the city, the water from the roofs had to go through that cleansing process, dry cycle design, and then, fed, and then that water fed the, the water feature. And I think it's really important to say that so that people understand how this system um, was working. And I, this is a close-up view of the actual site, because you can understand. It was about 20,000 square meters of green roofs. And at the time, it was a very innovative project because the water was used for the pond or the lake. We called it Lago di Piano, just to give them remembrance of this great architect. And also, we um, used the water for toilet flushing. And that's why the water had to be cleansed in this, oops, in this, um, in this square here to drink the water quality. You were able to drink this water. And uh, I think one of the major missions of this project was um, to actually develop not only the green roofs as stormwater mitigation tools and also as uh, water harvesting tools, but also to create spaces for the people. And this is some of the images of the gardens we designed there um, uh, in, the, in the actual courtyards. And these are all green roofs intensive green roofs. So basically, you could do anything on these green roofs. The only difference on these gardens compared to the extensive green roof is they're not really very ecologically viable. You need a lot of water to run them. And at that time, we, the irrigation was obviously run by the grid system. Nobody was at that time thinking of solar. If you would build this today, you would obviously use solar systems to actually run the electricity and so on. These are just some of the courtyards to show you. The other interesting thing about that project, we planted mature trees because the client wanted an instant garden. And I'm against that as a horticulturalist, I'm totally against planting big trees, but I see these gardens more like big flower pots. And they are artificial sites, they have nothing to do with nature at all. And the interest for me as a designer was because the constraints are so tough, and that was my challenge, that I, that's why I'm into green roofs at all, because they you have a concrete flooring, you have no ability to drain the, the, the soil, so you have to create all these situations for environments 
for the, the plants actually to thrive. And that is a very <coughs> complex process. And that interested me. But the most important about it is the research. So we did two types of research. Firstly, we did the soil research, and we used volcanic materials, low organic content. The reason was that the fire department didn't want us to have more than 20%. So we introduced that. Uh, we developed these systems, we monitored them, and we came up with a mix. I'm not going to go into detail too much, but if any of you is interested in that, I'm happy to send that. There's a report out on that. And that has been employed, and it's been monitored, and it's been used, and it's been very good. The other thing we also monitored was over the last 15 years since this project was built, how green, and this is maybe interesting for you from a horticultural standpoint of view, how do trees, mature trees, do on green roofs compared to the same species in the adjacent parks? And what the interesting result was, you won't believe it, they were doing better than in the parks because the maintenance on the roofs was more intensive and better controlled. The only problem was if the gardener poured on the wrong fertilizer or the wrong material, then the reaction was much more fierce than in a park because the dissemination of the water was um, uh, very not as fast as it would have been in a, in a public park area. So very interesting uh, to find that out. So you, these areas you can actually control. These are some other landscape uh, architectural courtyards I did after, in my own office with one of my colleagues, we designed these courtyards. Um, this is uh, for the bank who is in charge of building up East Germany, the islands is East Germany, and they wanted a historic garden, so we looked at it. It was a very complex building with modern buildings and historic buildings. This is also a green roof, even though it's on the ground plane underneath is a garage. So technically speaking, it's also a green roof. I just want to put that in to show you what kind of things you can do um, when it comes to designing green roofs. So ba basically, if you're smart and you have good understanding of it, particularly of the science which I'm now moving into, then there's big success in this field and it also pays well. The risk is high, the liability risk is high, but if you know what you're doing, and luckily I've so far had no problem, it pays well. One thing, one advice I have to give is if you introduce two green roofs, do your site management yourself. Don't have it give it up to anybody, because in the end of the day, that will make the decision how well the green roof is executed. Now, when you design green roofs, you have to know, and I mentioned that this morning much more in detail, about the climate. So we've been researching in Canada, and I, I calculated this place too, and I've calculated Costa Rica recently. We looked at what are the running reductions you can actually achieve. And you can see it here in the middle in the red, the 19%. In St. John's, for example, um, that would be in the Hunden, the reduction you can have. And you can see also on the little diagram below the stormwater runoff and the runoff reduction, you can also see when it happens and when there's the time in relation to it. What is interesting, if you look at um, Vancouver, because it doesn't rain at all in summer, you actually have to irrigate. This is why I came to this research. It's not enough. Uh, water there in summer to actually keep the green roofs green. So one has to understand that those green roofs there will maybe be brown or will have to, you have to add water, but for that you need to maybe harvest water to make those grow, those green roofs grow. But you can see it's 20% extensive runoff, but still, because of the precipitation pattern, you might need to irrigate. If you go to your place, and this is very pleasing to see, you can actually, if you reduce green roof, save much more runoff than in any of the other two places, 47%. So that's a good, good thing. And if you look at it in the intensive green roofs, you can see 68. So you can actually, when you employ those green roofs, it can be a really useful tool to actually reduce the runoff in this city. So maybe something to consider when you design your policies. If you look at Costa Rica, it's a bit of a nightmare. They have too much rain, and they have only a very short time in the year and have no rain at all. But still, 22% you can mitigate. It doesn't sound much, but it's a lot, and I will show you that in a minute. So why I'm so interested in eminent in the storm mode, and I put these four points down, which I find important about the green roofs. There are many more aspects, but for me, with the experience of being in this field for quite a while, I, I put these four points down for you to understand that these, for me, are the major um, four 
aspects, and the main one is at the bottom, obviously, the stormwater application. <coughs> now, the other thing you need to look at is when you employ green roofs, is the irrigation aspect. And these are the diagrams to show that. The red is the actual irrigation requirement. You can see in St. John's, you basically uh, don't need much irrigation, only in summer, a little bit. So you could survive with a certain plant selection without doing it. In Vancouver, you have a real problem because in summer, it doesn't rain at all for three, four months. It does too much the rest of the year, but when we actually need it to keep the plants green, it doesn't. So Vancouver is maybe not actually the most suitable, or if you need to put, in, you know, put uh, sort of basically a sister in place. If you look at unit one C, it's actually between. I would say you do need a bit of harvesting possibility, but there's certain plants maybe who wouldn't survive, at least with the extensive one. When it comes to the intensive one, you will need the irrigation system. And Costa Rica, basically only in winter, will have a problem when there is no rain. But that means for that time, definitely, because there's literally no rain at all, you also need to uh, accommodate that if you want to do intensive green use. So what I did as a first conclusion was to write down for all four uh, different places the, um, the, 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 the sort of my sort of conclusion for those. And if you look at Munsi, you will see both work quite efficiently as a stormwater tool. Only in July, you might need irrigation. So that's actually good news for you in comparison to the other places. <laughs> But um, you may also need to sort of have some space in your building to actually come up with the recycling or actually come up with the, the harvesting and the space where you can actually store that water. So what I do for cities is these kinds of diagrams to hammer in for the policymakers. Here is St. John's, it's fine as it is, but Vancouver, the building or adjacent to the building, there needs to be a space for storing that water. It can be at the top of the building, then you don't need the pumping, but then you have the risk maybe with the, the seepage and the weight of it. If you put it in the cellar, you need the pumping, you don't want to use the grid of the, the city, so you want to put in photovoltaic or something to run the pumps. So these are specifications where I would like to see the architects as when they build their structures or when they design their columns, that this should be part of every building. They should integrate that in their buildings. Now, the second part, and I think architects definitely call on that, is the green facade. What are the benefits? I've listed them here for you, some of them at least. They are a fascinating tool, very unresearched currently, and I show you the different typologies now. And this is an area we need to do more research, but one thing everybody knows is Patrick Burns' work. It's beautiful but it's not sustainable. It uses a lot of water, I mentioned it this morning. It uses the plants that be exchanged all the time. So this is beautiful to look at, beautiful artistic work. I congratulate Patrick of Limo to use him, and it's fantastic, but it doesn't help us sustainably. We need to look at green facades in a much more different way. So there are three systems, and I made these little diagrams to show them to you. The first system is panels, the Japanese are really good at these, which are screwed to the facade with, with the metal angle and the metal sort of uh, fastening system. And it can be a concrete facade, it can be a brick facade, and you can see this kind of pattern you can create. You can then have these things pre-planted or you plant them on site. That really depends on you. The second type of facade is a climbing system, which is planted from the ground up. Most sustainable from the point of irrigation, if the bed is wide enough, you won't need much irrigation happening. And also interesting in this system is you could use it also over the windows, depending on what kind of facade you, you're going to integrate. So we'll also reduce the, it can also be reduced as a cooling effect. Or the double facade, like this one here, again, where you can have the light intake out, so you can have a metal mesh. So there are hundreds of systems for this one here, or wire mesh, uh, and a double facade, which then can act the circulation. The interesting thing about this one to the one before is you can have planter boxes elevated and, and then obviously also irrigated. So there are many systems, and we are currently, and this is why I put this in red, further research is needed. So it's, a, it's really a call on all of us, 
us. And one of my Greensteinland friends and colleagues is back in Spain and he's just establishing a research unit at, um, in Madrid at the university experimenting with Green Walls doing his PhD on this subject. But it's one area we should not forget because the evapotranspiration of all the facades of a building is high, much higher than just the roof. So you have lots of space to have evapotranspiration happening, cooling the city and improving the microclimate. Okay. As you can see in this diagram, if you have that little strip at the bottom, the evapotranspiration rate that creates in comparison to the evapotranspiration rate on the facade. I think that's a pretty obvious effect. Same when it comes to recycling. How do you recycle? You harvest the water from the roof. So this is another discussion. Maybe a green roof is the wrong thing, but maybe green facades is the right thing. So you could harvest the water from the roof and then store it and then use it for the irrigation. For example, if you're in an area where the cooling of the building, um, in, in, in this tropical area, the cooling of the building is really important, this would be one system. You, you harvest the water on the roof and then you, yeah, then you um, charge it through pipes and irrigate your panels like that. Now, the fourth point I'm going to talk about is a new thing where I'm very involved actually on the ground plane more than on the uh, on the roof plane, but it's also recently um, very it's taken off is urban agriculture in cities again. There's a list of benefits here which explains that what I was very interested with these kinds of projects, if you apply that stuff, where do you store the water and how do you irrigate the crop is the key. So I see this again as the holistic system designed together with the architect, where do you put the water storage where do you put the PVC, the portable toy types, to actually generate the electricity to um, get this water irrigating your crop? And if there's any energy left, it should go back into your building. So these are aspects, I think, where we all need to really start getting much more thorough that we think in the system much more holistically as a team. This means the urban planner. It means the architect, and last but least us, the landscape architects. We need to cooperate much more. We are not there just to shrug up the, the beds around the buildings. We should be working together with the architects and the urban planners, or if a lot of the landscape architects and architects are both urban planners and architects, all landscape architects, and work together as a team to come up with much better, unique solutions as we have done so far. When it comes to rooftop agriculture, it's not going to save the world. What it does, it has three benefits. And the second one, and I did some studies on that, is the social benefit. That's actually the key part. It, it, it makes, it educates the local population. It brings the local population together. Obviously, economic and environmental benefits it has too, but the social benefits shouldn't be underrated. And that's why I, I put them in orange and quite prominent in the center. This is their garden in New York on a rooftop where they are planting uh, plants, which then go into a kitchen for the poor and to feed the poor people. The problem with using these systems, and you should know that if you, the limitations is, obviously they can't infiltrate in the soil, there's a limited soil depth, and then because of that, the water retention capacity is also limited. So, and the worst and the most problematic is the limited availability of organic content. So this balance is actually, for me, from the point of environmental and economic, it's not as strongly rated as it is from the social, as I said before. And I brought you a couple of case studies. This one in Vancouver, it's quite a cool one. It's on the YMCA building. So these plots feed the people who sleep in this building at night. And basically, they can also go up there and burn it. And it's a, a one way for them to also understand and value food again as a really important resource of living. The second one, this is one of my favorite, is the Fairmount. Fairmount is a very important, known old hotel chain in Canada. And the Fairmount on the waterfront in Vancouver, they have a garden on the top where they grow their herbs for their kitchen and they have beehives, everything. And Vancouver in the last 10, 15 years has really um, improved in the sense of what kind of quality of food there is, and that has to do with the population coming from all over the world demanding fresh vegetables, demanding fresh spices and so on. And that basically um, took off, uh, this is one of the examples here. 
And the third one is this group I showed before, the great one group, top firm. By the way, all this stuff is online. If any of you is interested, I've written a couple of peer-reviewed papers on this. I can, for the uh, architecture conference, which you have, like we have a landscape, we have a conference once a year where the talks meet. So I went to New Orleans and I presented this. So if any of you is interested in that, I'm happy to give you more information. What is important about these, any kind of experimental system like that is the water and how do you irrigate it? So again, it goes back to the precipitation pattern. And I showed, I'm showed, i showing you here St. John's again, Vancouver. And it also, with the little diagrams, it shows you how much, how big the cisterns need to be and how much water you need to actually irrigate. And what we then find, we run Tokyo this time. Tokyo has such a high precipitation pattern in summer when it needs it for the plants and vegetables to grow, you don't need a storage system. So what that shows is you really need to get somebody in when you design these exciting systems to calculate the stuff before you actually put the pencil to paper. <coughs> Basically what that means, if you look at a green room, this should be the strategy. First, the climate. You need to understand the precipitation, the temperature, and the buffer transpiration rate of them. The process of that. You need to have those figures. The second then is the crop selection and what kind of irrigation system. And then, after that, then you start designing your root crops, the soil depth and so on, loading capacity, so all the aspects which are just And often, people start with the last, and then they realize, oh my god, I don't have enough, I don't have enough rain. Oh, now I have to use the tap water. And this is the wrong approach. What I'm saying, science should be first before we design the master plan. And recently I've been asked often to go in for architecture teams and landscape architecture teams to calculate, so they bring me a site and they ask me to calculate how much space, how much green roofs, how much swale space we need to drain all the water on the site if we build this and this design. So I give them the square footage or square meters if you want in Canada we have meters uh, of space we need and then they start designing the buildings. So they think about the swale and the rain gardens before they even put pencil to paper. And I will show them. Now, and this is maybe for the students more than for the faculty college. How does the research? How, how do we research this? I mean, I'm a practitioner, and I and I said, well, um, it's applied science for me, but you know, I wanted to put some figures in there. So what I did was I went to this police and I asked them to give me the survey maps they used for the drug trafficking in Vancouver to find the people where they monitor with these maps who um, has the grow up where. And they're very precise maps. You can zoom in on them, and you can detect what kind of roof is it, what kind of materials on the roof, everything. So they're well equipped. And being a prop, I got these maps. And with these high resolution maps, I developed case studies. This is downtown Vancouver, and that's the first one we started off. It's so a 20 hectare site, and we looked at a cross section where we had all building typologies possible small houses, medium sized houses, skyscrapers, the full program. Then we went in to calculate what kind of land we, we surveyed, what kind of land use commercial, retail, office, church, townhouse, what happens, and classified it as you can see on the right here residential and commercial. Then I went in to calculate the CO2 emission of this area, and this was quite crazy. I had to phone up all the electricity and gas companies to get the bills of each person living in this 20 hectare site. So there's a couple of students who were not happy they had to help me phone it up. <laughs> and then with that, we calculated using the uh, Energy 10 program, they're much more sophisticated programs, but it took us ages to run this because we are, I had one guy who was really into it, I'm not into it, but he spent half a year to suss it out and we run the Energy 10 program. And we calculated for this 20 hectares what are, what's the what's the energy use? How much do we actually spend? And uh, we came up. Uh, I just go back on that. At the at the bottom end, it shows you how much kilojoules this area produces and how much CO2. So 24 megatons. That's crazy for just a part of the city. So we were thinking we need to find solutions to remedy this. The second thing we looked at is green versus grey. So we actually analyzed this area, which part of that area has actually connection to the ground? Where is there not impervious surface? And you can see only 
That's a bit of a nightmare. The rest is all impervious. Second thing we looked at, existing surface areas. How big are the facades? How big is the roof? What's the street level? What's the green area? These are the, sum, the summary here for this area. And what it shows you, one always forgot this so far, and I will talk about this in a minute why. The facade, they make out a huge percentage. So what we did to find out about um, the stormwater runoff, we used this TR-55 in combination with the crop coefficient method. So we calculated the buffer transpiration rates and so on for this area to find out how much is the stormwater runoff. We looked at the existing stormwater runoff for the rooftops, for the street level, for the total. So look at the total. It's that figure down there, 144 for this area, 144,000. That, just to give you some scale, is the rooftop areas is 20, so eight hectares, 20 American, not soccer, not European soccer fields, uh, American uh, soccer uh, football fields, just to give you a scale. And the runoff is 22 times the Olympic size pool in Beijing. So it gives you an understanding, this little site, how much that generates on runoff each year. So we thought, oh, that is serious. We need to do something. Well, there have been things put in place. The Germans invented this at the beginning after unification. It's called the Green Factor. The Green Factor was put into place in Germany because after unification, the building boom went crazy. Everybody wanted to concrete everything and just sell their buildings and make it make money instead of thinking about the landscape, the runoff, and anything. So the policymakers introduced, the colleague of mine introduced, the green roof factor. At the time, because they were in a rush, it's not that yet that great. At the time, it was the only tool we had. And what it basically did, it took a part, it had, when you handed in a drawing for planning permission, you had to have 30% landscape area. And you could calculate points for green roofs, for green facades, for pervious areas, and so on. So it was a bit of a, a lead kind of thing. Um, a bit of a start, but it was kind of a control method. Then Malmö in Sweden took that on and refined it. And after that, America took it on and created the Seattle Green Factor, which is even more thorough. The problem is in Seattle is only used on public buildings. In Europe, it's used, in Germany, it's used on every building if you apply for planning permission. So it's not yet thorough enough because obviously it's difficult to push a policy through like that. We said that the Seattle Green Factor, which looks like this, you fill in a score sheet and then you come at a result. Basically, the idea is the same, 30% should be landscape, landscape area. So what we did was we used this factor, but we said, and this was the prediction, the hypothesis we had at the beginning, it's not aggressive enough. We have to make it more aggressive. So what we did was we applied this scenario. And this is the sort of what we came up with by reading these amounts is uh, listed here on the right, um, the area. And what we came up with is, when we do that, that's what would happen. By greening the facades, greening the roof, that is the runoff reduction you will get, 13%. Okay, 13%, great. Before greening, that is 57 pools, after greening, 7 pools less, 54. Well, it doesn't sound much, but it's at least a start. We thought, good start, but we need to improve this factor. So we were also looking at other aspects. How could we employ um, the energy reduction? So how could we reduce the CO2 emission? How could we stop in Vancouver, which is pretty cool for this time of year, the use of air conditioning at all? We don't need air conditioning in Vancouver. So by applying the facades and greenery, we were thinking we could reduce and reduce that. And you can see here the figures. And then the total after greening it, the energy reduction would be 9%, and the CO2 emission reduction would be 12%. Now, what we said was that we wanted to expand this green factor. And what we did was we integrated, and this was not done before, the green factor was just looked at on the, on the, vertic on the horizontal plane. Nobody thought about the vertical plane, which is the facades. So we added the facades and the facade green onto it, and then obviously the greening area would be much larger, and by that, plus the introduction of photovoltaic or thermal panels, we could improve 
the situation much better. So we were thinking of developing not a green factor from Seattle, but a green factor maybe for Vancouver. So by adding the facade greening, as well as the blue things, which is the, the, the green technology, we could actually improve the situation. And this is, with these figures added on, you can see that actually the runoff would be increased another 3% and the, through the facade another 8%. That's a huge leap from the one before. And I think what we try to say with that is to the policymakers, I presented this to the city, this is what we were thinking of hypothetically before and after what Vancouver should look like when we today apply these kinds of green stakes. But then we thought we have to look at other cities. So this time we looked at Kelowna, which is half a desert, uh, where they grow the wine in Canada. It's got a very different climate. It's in the middle of the Rockies, pretty dry, not enough rain. We did the same procedure, came up with the same solution. The only difference is, as you can see in the cross section, the build up is lower, and they have a lot of the spaces, car park space. So we did the same run, the same populations. It was very similar to the one in Vancouver. And you can see here on these diagrams, very different precipitation patterns. So in Vancouver, it's much higher than in Cologne. And when you compare that to the diagram and the water use in comparison, if you look at Vancouver, it rains a lot in the, in the winter and not at all in the summer. And then you relate it to the irrigation of the plants, you can see there isn't enough water there to even do the greenery you want to do. And I said this morning, what you have to do is you have to irrigate 54 millimeters in summer if you have a very extensive, very thin green roof, which is the cheapest and cheapest to build. If you start building up to 250 mil, it gets more expensive because of the loading. So this is the sort of standard discussion. When you look at Kelowna, you can see it doesn't literally rain at all, but you still have the same evapotranspiration rates and you still have the same need of water usage for the plants. So we decided that maybe Kelowna isn't the right place to use a green roof at all. Now, if you do, only 44% should be green and the rest should be there for harvesting the water to keep that roof alive. Or you could use the car park spaces, collect the water, pump it up on the green roof and irrigate like that, as you can see here on the right, on the left. But what I'm trying to say with that is not every place is appropriate. And these are some simulations how we thought this would look like. And it also shows you on these images how big the car parking, what percentage that has in the city of Kelowna. And that's obviously detrimental, where we as landscape architects can come in and actually really do something to improve that situation. Now, the final one on that one, I run it for Shanghai. In Shanghai, we use the smaller site because they have smaller blocks, but we calculated the same percentage, and it's pretty similar situation with the uh, green versus gray as it was in Vancouver or in Kelowna. But the difference was, and this is interesting, Shanghai has very similar, a little bit higher precipitation patterns than Vancouver. But the difference, just as a reminder, this is Vancouver and this is Shanghai. It rains in the summer. So the water is all available for the plants. So Shanghai is a perfect space to have any kind of green roof, at least extensive, if not intensive, and you don't need to irrigate much. So it's actually a perfect place, and they really need it being such a densified city. That shows um, only in comparison, if you look at the, the in comparison to Vancouver, it needs irrigation, 54 mil, while in Vancouver and Shanghai it doesn't need any at all. So the reduction of runoff is also better, even though it rains more in, in Shanghai, but you can keep up more on the roof because it, because the plants do better in summer, they have transpire better, so you can actually reduce the runoff um, higher. That also shows you the precipitation pattern really dictates when a green roof is suitable. If you look at um, uh, in comparison to the intensive green roofs like this one here. If you, for Vancouver, this is why I always say that Vancouver is the wrong place to have uh, intensive green roofs. But if they do, they have their systems to keep them going. In Shanghai, you would need to irrigate them either. So that again shows the runoff reduction of intensive green roofs 40% in Vancouver and 57 in Shanghai. 
So even intensive gorillas would work really well in that scene. Now, as a final conclusion, and that's really important to know, and I think this is one of the biggest critiques I have currently happening in the, in the States and in Canada with the green groups and this whole profession of this fashion. A lot of the stuff which is on the market here has not been tested enough. A lot of the materials put on the market and people have not enough understanding how the different materials work with each other. So it is really vital that the academia and testing stations test the material. That when you employ green roof materials, that you employ materials which have been tested five to ten years for durability, so that there are no chemical reaction of the different materials, that the root barrier doesn't react with your waterproofing layer, etc., etc. That's one of the biggest problems in the States I'm finding and in Canada that there is not yet that in place. It's in the making. So what I would advise you to do is I'm not trying to promote Germany, but Germany has 40 years of experience and we have all these standards now in English, the FLL. Uh, and you can download that stuff. It's all online. And um, I, I'm currently proofreading the New Zealand report for green roofs and they've been using them for making their own research and they have been obviously tweaking them to their climate and their materials available. But why do that research all from the ground up when it's already there? It's much more useful to take the existing research and then add on. So my, one of my first advices is that you really use the materials which is appropriate and which has been tested for a long time. The second thing is the climate. You need to understand the climate and the buffer transpiration rates. The States is fantastic. That stuff is mostly online available. In Canada, we are a bit behind. But the States has most of the stuff openly available, if not the municipality side. Then you can decide what plants you're going to use, what kind of irrigation. The irrigation system has to be discussed with the architect, because maybe there are certain areas where the architect, uh, where, the, where this irrigation pipe needs to go through the roof, somewhere to the root ceiling, or there needs to be a cistern. So a collaboration between both fields has to be dealt with at the beginning, not at the end. At the beginning, it saves a lot of money. And then, obviously, the, the, the rainwater and stormwater management plan has to be worked out. And another thing which is often important, you need to have a backup system for water, just in case it doesn't work. And these are valuable plants you have on that roof. You need to have some sort of other system in place which then functions. So you need what we call an electric lead, which monitors what goes on up there. And if it doesn't work, if the irrigation doesn't work, it rings a bell or something with the, the, the caretaker that something can be done. A backup system is really important. And you have to use to be really on the, on the go, on the contemporary, you have to use renewable energy applications to run the pumps and um, solar or photovoltaic, whatever, to actually, or wind energy, to run the systems. Otherwise, they're not really very sustainable. And the other thing, I think, from a design point of view, when you design these green roofs, if possible, make them partially public accessible. That will help to disseminate the knowledge of this field to the public. And often rooms are great spaces to be on and experience the city. So this combination of public space, social space, gathering space is important. And when you do that, and that's why I put these images on the right, you will avoid the failure you see with this green facade on the top left, right? And at the bottom, you will also reduce, and this is the key, the water and the irrigation of tap water in the city. So, you should do everything not to use tap water for your green rooms. If you use tap water, it isn't a sustainable, it's just aesthetics. And I leave you with that. Thank you.
know, I appreciate the um, second part of your lecture where you talked about the research with your 20 third areas. And I think it's so important, we've been talking about this in some studios here, to really make sure that you are calculating and balancing these flows, whether it's water or materials or resources or waste. Um, can you uh, tell the students what, where you have published this, or if you've published this, yeah, so um, that they can really understand the way that you calculated these things? I've mentioned this morning that in the landscape journal, and the next one out, it's already online, so you can already download it if you have access to it. If you just Google my name and you go landscape journal, you'll find the article. That's maybe the most prominent of the research which took us um, the last four years. It's uh, really uh, it shows you all the calculations. I've given it to my students in my grading and drainage class, and uh, they say it's pretty easy to understand. And it's the importance of scientists or people who work with complicated stuff to make it available and apply it, particularly for that reason. So I would say that's a really good one. The other one, which is really worth, worth reading, is the Canadian Resource Journal, Water Journal. It's in French and English. Um, that is also now available online, I think even free, um, where we, the first part of my research is published. So, and then a lot of it is published. If you're interested in urban agriculture, at the ACSA conference in New Orleans this year, we published two, the one paper there, and at the CELA conference in Maastricht, we published another paper on urban agriculture. So um, if any of you want to have those, I'm happy to email them to Jody, and then she can disseminate those. Um, if there's any more interest, a lot of the other papers I've done for the civil engineers at the LID conferences, the low impact development conferences by the civil engineers, they're not peer reviewed, but they're much better from the quality and thoroughness than the conferences we have, sadly. So uh, for me, that doesn't make a difference. They're excellent conferences. I would advise every young landscape architect to go there. There's a lot, they have a stream on green roofs, and to be honest with you, their research, and I'm on their research advisory panel, they are much more thorough about it, and that's embarrassing because it's actually our field than us. So the civil engineers, again, are taking over our field and doing it more thorough. So it's important for you to go and read that stuff. So I've published uh, two or three papers in one, and three papers we published. Yes? So from a public policy standpoint, how are you working with communities on what to do with gray water? This is always uh, a sticking point in terms of how communities would use, reuse their gray water opportunities. Because it's this is a good question, and I'm very open to you. Um, the Australians are top notch on that. It's not my field. Uh, gray water is a very specific process, completely different. And um, I have not done any research at all. My specific interest is in the surface water. I know there are ways. And it has a lot to do with what kind of um, yeah, what kind of filtration and cleansing system you use. But the most advanced are in Australia because they have so incredible droughts over the last three, four years that the best research out on that is in that country. But it, I'm not really very good at that. I'm very open. Uh, yes, to continue that, have you done any research on parking lots and streets? So that they become a lot more sustainable? Yes. Well, you have the gutters. I've done a paper um, two years ago in Vienna on, we looked more at the money to convince the city in Vancouver if they would use rain gardens and swales in the city for their parking lots and the streets, <coughs> they could reduce, um, we calculated figures, um, they could actually reduce the taxpayers' money or the money they spend on the sewage system drastically. And that paper I can also give you if you're interested in that. But specifically on parking, I haven't done any research. I know a couple of my German colleagues have, but most of it sadly still is in Germany. But in Germany, just to um, had on, when I was practicing landscape architect, I built a lot of car parks, and they all had to have swale systems. And what normally happens, they are designed in conjunction with the civil engineers, so you calculate it, and they check your calculations. But it's standard now in Germany that swales are used. 
best city in North America, uh, in the US, is Portland for that. They have done the best research, and Tom Lipton, who's just been made a fellow at the ASLA, he's the landscape architect, he's worked in this for 25 years, and I would, I do this with my students every two years, I take them to Portland, I would highly recommend, he loves doing tours with his students there, rain gardens, whales, and really aesthetically pleasing swale systems with parking lots to look at. So it's an absolute must, I think, for any ongoing landscape architect. 